So yeah, hi, Scott. Uh, thanks for having me and, and hi, everyone. Yeah, so I'm Dave Mareels, uh, Director uh, of MDR here. So MDR very much is, is my baby uh, from a product standpoint. So I work within the SecOps division um, and uh, fairly new to the role. So I've stepped in probably a couple of weeks ago now. Um, and so hopefully you'll be seeing me more and more. Um, hopefully I'll be working much more closely with Scott and the team here. And I'm, I'm really excited for that. So and I'm really excited to hear your feedback and and. You know, to take that on board and to influence our roadmap to make sure what we build is is an absolute you know a kick-ass service for you guys. Um, prior to Sophos, so I've actually been here for a year, and prior to Sophos, I uh, was the CEO and co-founder of a startup called SocOS, and we were acquired by Sophos last April, so just a year and a few months. And so the story I'm going to be talking about today is about all, all things you know what is actually under the hood. So I'm going to share quickly share my screen. Um, so hopefully you can see full screen, Sophos MDR there. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah, great. Um, so what we're going to take a look at is these integration packs and a view under the hood. So I love the example I just heard then for, from the duo uh, example. So that uh, very much uh, is, is close to my heart because my startup was in fact all about third party integrations and, and a data processing engine. So we built what we were pitching as a sort of like a SIM replacement or a saw tool. So all about that alert fatigue problem and all about the triage problem. And so Sophos acquired us um, to really open the next chapter of, you heard the acronym MTR, right? So we launched that MTR service a couple of years ago. In November last year, um, we, fully integrated that technology that we brought over from our company under the hood of MDR, which then enabled us to give a, a much more of a, a vendor agnostic approach. So prior to November last year, um, you as an MSP could only provide an MDR offering based on the Sophos stack. I'd say so Sophos XDR primarily is the crown jewels and the endpoint product that, that is very much the backbone of our MDR, but it was a Sophos firewall play, the cloud play, the NDR play, the email play. It was not, oh, one of my customers have a, has a FortiGate here or, or, or a Duo. Um, but now, since November last year, you can go up and say, great, I don't really care what stack you're running. Um, you've got a Palo on the firewall. You've got a force point dark, dark trace on tra on prem. You've got Okta or Duo for your IAM provider. You don't have to rip and replace that. You don't have to go in and say, try and upsell a Sophos product. You can say, we can now offer that, take those logs in, make sense of those logs, uh, and provide a really awesome protected monitoring service and MDR offering on top of those uh, those sources. And that was very much the technology we brought over from uh, from SocOS. So the strategic driver for Sophos and why the acquisition made sense was very much a market need. No doubt, probably you guys screaming out saying, can you also take my security logs from my other products? And so what I'm going to dive into today is try to bring this alive for you. So I have the formidable task of actually trying to Answer the question, and, and look, you guys are selling this all the time, so I'm sure this will resonate, but when we were pitching this, right, and, and a lot of vendors pitch this, it's, oh, we can take your logs, and, and a savvy customer will always say, but what the hell are you actually doing with them? Oh, well, we take them and correlate them, okay? Give me more. What do you actually, what does that mean to correlate them? And so I have the formidable task to actually try to bring that alive, and, and I'll be, it'll be full of an example of actually showing, showing you from onboarding a tool, which you guys see this in your customer dashboard, um, so Rody just said, you know, he would have enabled Cisco Duo. So he would have gone to this site. He would have clicked on the Cisco Duo tile. And he said it was a super simple task. It was literally go to go to your uh, customer's um, Duo, get the URL, get their API, and copy and paste it into the central, in, into this dashboard here. We'll have self-serve instructions for those tiles for you. But that's basically how you enable it for your customers. And once you've enabled that, then what happens? So, so Rudy just said, great, I had a push, a push fraud, MFA, suspicious activity that flagged up a case that then our MDR wrote, wrote, wrote a case up and, and sent it over and, and then they went to do some further investigation. But what, how did we get there? Right? And that's what the focus will be today is, so from telemetry source that you see on this left here, all the way to customer escalation, which was, it was Rudy and, and you guys, you're the MSP, you are the customer, you are the customer for us and we'll be escalating those cases to you. What happens in between? How on earth do we take a bunch of logs? How do we turn them into something beautiful to work with? How do we correlate them and how do we escalate them to our to our MDR analysts? And then how do we how do we escalate that to you for you then to to, to front that customer customer communication and customer response um, is what I'm going to bring alive for you. So third party telemetry pipeline, that detection pipeline, 
I'm going to just touch on sort of the four things about how we ingest and filter the logs, how we how we talk about cleaning those logs, how, what do we do when we correlate, how do we think about the escalation challenge, and really these four boxes is is the 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 software that we wrote and was was in my startup. So I'm well placed to talk about this, and I can go as technical as you want. So if you have any questions, uh, please shout. But that's what it's in store for you. We're gonna we're gonna do a deep dive showing you what are we actually doing with the data and give you the full sort of journey. And I think I'm gonna base it off some 40 gate logs. So 40 gates are gonna come in and you're gonna see it correlate into a beautiful case, escalate, and you're gonna see that that MDR analyst go to work and then send you guys the case right up. So without further ado, and and please, Scott, I can't see. So if you if you have any questions, just just interrupt, mate. So ingest and filter, probably the most boring stage, but a very important one. How do we get the logs into us? And so there are two primary uh, high level ways we do this. One is first and foremost, is the customer tool on-prem or are they cloud hosted? So on-prem that requires us. And if anyone, any MSP has done this on behalf of, of your customers, you'll be, you'll be well-versed here. It's spinning up a VM on the customer network, deploying an OVA that contains a basically syslog server, which is our log collector. You'll go to your Palo Alto, you'll, you'll set up a syslog forwarding rule, sends the logs into our, uh, our OVA right into that VM, and then it forwards it onto the cloud um, into our Sophos Central data lake. The cloud hosted tools are easy. Literally, you just heard it then. Uh, Rudy just talked about it was a five minute job, right? Microsoft's even easier. You click on the button, you say authenticate, we'll go back, pull the API creds, tick, tick, tick. And then once we've got the API creds there, every whatever the frequency is, we hit those API endpoints and we start batching and pulling all the alerts from your customer's uh, API environment. Now, a lot of vendors stop there. A lot of MDR people will say, yeah, we collect, yeah, we got loads of connectors and we collect it, right? And I'll be preaching for years that it's not the hard part. Just to collect the logs and chuck them in a data lake, anyone can do. The hard part is how do you make those logs sing and dance? How do you correlate them? How do you turn them into stories? How do you operationalize that threat data? Because ultimately, what we're really dealing with here is a data problem. We've got a crap load of data screaming at us. How do I spot the signal and the noise? How do I operationalize those threat feeds, turn them into actionable intelligence for us to pass on to those to that, that benefit to the customer? That's the ultimate goal here. So it's 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 a, a big phallus out there when people say, oh, we collect everything. Always push them a bit further and say, well, what are you actually doing with it? And so let's answer that exact question. So first step is clean. This is, this is the slide I always say cures insomnia, right? So have a look at this, and, and I'm sure you're, I'm speaking to the choir here, right? Three firewall vendors, Palos at the top. This is a FortiGate in the middle and a Cisco Meraki at the bottom. All IPS logs from three separate vendors. The challenge for our customers and your end users and your customers is, how the hell do I make sense of this? How do I start to compare Palo with FortiGate? And that's just a firewall log. How do I compare FortiGates with Cisco Duo? And how do I compare that with Microsoft te telemetry, right? And you know, the, the six or seven products we, we, we suck in from the Graph API. How on earth do I start to make sense of that? And just to really highlight what the problem is, that you don't have to read this screen. The problem is, have a look at this vendor B, and I'm just going to highlight a few things. For the untrained eye, you probably, you probably won't get this. But for the trained eye, you go, oh, here we go. Action equals allow. That's a very important property. That says the firewalls allow some sort of connection to take place. But then the problem, just highlighting it for our users, is look at this, seven. Seven is how FortiGate classify the severity. But it also tells me the severity is high. It also tells me the critical score is 15. It also tells me the critical level is critical. So looking at that log alone, it's, it's a mess. Just, just in that single line of code, that log, how the hell do I determine exactly how severe this is, let alone how do I compare that with the other tens of thousands of logs streaming at me from six other tools? And that's the problem we take on. So our very first step in this pipeline is to take all that seemingly independent noise and those crappy logs coming into us and we turn it and we clean it into a beautiful structure. So we transform every single log and when it comes out of our pipeline and that clean function, we've normalized it into the schema that you see on the screen and we've mapped it automatically to MITRE ATT&CK. So I'm not gonna dwell along because this is the, the uh, you can tell I'm fun at parties, right? Like I get excited about normalized schema, but it's super important. It's super important for our analysts to do threat hunting, and it's super important for us to do the high value task at the back end, which is correlation and escalation. But have a look at this, source systems. This is how my analyst knows it's a Palo Alto or, a, or whatever, whatever third party product, Cisco Duo. I've got the threat types here, that's the MITRE attack. So think about this normalized schema. My analyst can go in and you can, you can raise a case to us and say, hey, MDR team, go look at spear phishing on this customer for me. We can go on 
we can use this normalized schema and say, find me on this timestamp, so over the weekend. Right? So show me Saturday and Sunday for this customer, everything relating to spear phishing. So I'm abstracting to the threat level. So I don't have to go and look in the logs. I can just say, find me spear phishing. And I don't care if that's Mimecast or, or Microsoft Office or wh whatever it may be, whatever proof point, right? It's another tool we integrate with. I don't care what underlying log source it is. I care what the threat is telling me. And so having a normalized schema with threat indicators line to Mitre attack um, is a super powerful first step in our pipeline. And so every third party data. So Rudy, Rudy, I hopefully asked, answered your first question about like, yeah, what, what actually is happening? That's the first step that's happening, mate. Your Cisco Duo alerts are coming in and we're transforming it into this schema. Now, after we've got a beautiful normalized schema, then the next task, which is hopefully I bring this alive with a story is, and you can tell I, 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 I'm not too good, I'm not in marketing. This is the prob problem we now have to face. How do I take all the raw logs and how do I turn them into a story? How do I turn that into a case that makes sense, that my analyst can group and, and look at on a case-centric or threat-centric point of view, not an, a single alert. You know, the whole alert whack-a-mole, right? Alert fatigue and alert whack-a-mole problem. Our analysts don't live in a world isolated alert by alert. They, they live in a cluster view of the world, which is a, which is case centric, which is threat centric. And so the, the challenge for us, right, as the MDR vendor that have your backs is how do I determine which of these logs, which you see on the screen, how the hell do I determine which of these 10,000 that I've seen from one of your customers, how do I determine which of those 10,000 are related? That's the challenge that we have to take on. After we've cleaned them, the next question is how do I group them? And so if you're used to SimWorld, this is really our security analytics engine. And I'm going to show this to you now. It's actually based on a real example and a real case. So 10th of November, let's, let's step back in time, 2022. 10,000 alerts are streaming in. And our system is constantly looking at every single one of them, cleaning every single one of them, and saying, how, this, how is this alert that I've received now related to all the other ones that have received in the past? And what our system will do is say, I've found 20 that are related and we'll group these. So you see 20 alerts here from FortiGate. You can see here in the alert message, you see six unique alert types, V bulletin, route string. You've got think PHP controls, think PHP requests, Drupal cores, and Joomla cores, right? So someone's scanning for some sort of vulnerability. They're exploiting some sort of vulnerabilities here, right? They're remote code execution across your public facing assets. But the system is clever enough to say those 20 are related, so I'm going to group them. And how on earth it's done that is we actually map everything because we map everything to the technique level. And we track all the entities. So I know what the user uses, the host names, the IP addresses. And I can track this through time. And that's where the USP and the real IP of this baby is about how we can track this through time. And that's the real, that's the, the secret source of this, uh, of this correlation engine. And the system has gone, hey, I've got 20 alerts over the space of one hour. So 548 to 638. So it's an hour of alerts. And the system has gone, they're all the same technique on MITRE. And it's all happening from the same external IP address. So, hey, analyst, you probably want to group these 20 and analyze these 20 in the same breath rather than looking at each one of these in isolation as and when they're spewing at you. But not only do we that, we look at the metadata itself. And remember how I pointed out that field that said action equals allow? In our language, that's it's unblocked. It, it, it's, it's not been blocked. It hasn't been actioned, unactioned in our world. And so all of a sudden, I have a cluster of alerts over a space of an hour, all relating to the same technique, that all contain the same external and all the alerts are telling me they're unactioned. So I've grouped that and that's one cluster for my analyst to view. Now, that's great. We've grouped a lot of stuff together. Guess what this thing does really well? It groups noise really well, okay? So not only does this do a really good job of correlating some interesting signals, you know, one after two hours or three, oh, those three are related and that's probably some high fidelity signal. We, we do a really good job of just grouping related activity, whether it's malicious or not. So now the next question we have is, how the hell do I escalate things? So all these, all these clusters are coming in. I've taken 10,000 logs and I've correlated them into 200 things to look at. Right? So it's a really massive reduction in, in, in triage effort. But of those 200, which ones do I send to my analyst? Right? It's a big challenge, right? So is it the first four? Like how on earth do I start to think about this, the, the escalation challenge? And so now this is where we have security analytics that run over logic that runs over what you just saw, that cluster. Every single one of those clusters then go through this sort of uh, threat use case classification. And so you can see here, right, because we've done the cleaning well and we've correlated them into stories, I can write really nice escalation logic. So I can say, hey, if I see unaction persistence attempts 
that's probably something you want to investigate, right? So I can write rules that are really threat centric. And what on, what on earth does that mean on action persistence? Well, that means, because I understand the data and cleaned it well, I know the mitra tactic was mapped to persistence. I know that there's external entities in those alerts, and I know those alerts are telling me they're unactioned. So you as our partners, right? If they're no one asks you, well, what the hell, what's Sophos doing in the back end, right? What's that MDR doing? This is exactly what we're doing. We're grouping them and we're looking at threat detection use cases. And so if you, I hope you agree, you look down at this list and obviously it's not the only four, right? Um, you go, okay, yeah, of course you want to be looking at that. So unaction command and control, yeah, of course you probably want to be looking at that. So if we see alerts that have command and control, that have external entities and the alerts are telling me they're unactioned, my analysts will investigate that. And this is really powerful. This is a super robust way of writing rules rather than like on the individual alert level, right? We're using, we're abstracting to the threat level, abstract it away from the underlying source system. Have a look at that, isn't that? I mean, I think this is beautiful. We don't, you don't see here, if it's Paolo, do this. I don't care if it's Paolo. I don't care if it's Fortigate. I don't care if it's Checkpoint. I don't care if it's SonicWall. If it's a mitre attack, it's command and control and it's external and it's on action, we're gonna create a case. Now. I would love to be there in person with you and actually ask you a question. But looking down these rules, I usually ask when I am in person, I say, the example I just showed you of those 20 alerts, would that have been triggered? And sort of I'm going to highlight, you know, with this with this cluster here, you know, brush the cobwebs from five minutes ago, exploitation for client execution, unactioned, would this trigger a rule? And if you're hopefully you're listening, I haven't put you to sleep already, data processing, uh, that would have triggered that rule. And at which point my analyst gets that in there, their, their queue and it says there's a cluster of alerts here that need your attention analyst and then you need to pick this up and go and run with it and they're going to say but why did it trigger and then we have a beautiful english explanation about why it triggered because there is a bunch of alerts here that are on action client execution exploit attempt what that actually means is there's exploitation for client execution with unactioned alerts it doesn't tell me if it's fortigate at this stage right i don't care if it's fortigate or not as i said but my analyst is going to pick this cluster up and they're going to do some investigation and now what you're going to see um, is what our analyst did about it. All right, so this is the actual case write-up um, that if you're, again, if you're in Collaborate, you would have this case, boom, sent, sent to you guys. <clears throat> so if, you, if this was your customer, this would look familiar. Um, and so let's dive in. So this is what our analyst did about it, and this is the, the case write-up that, that an MSP or the end user would have received. So on November the 10th, 2022, the MDR team investigated a case consisting of 20 on action Fortigate alerts, which have been grouped together. The case indicates an exploitation for client execution attempt, where this is the prob probing IP address has been confirmed to be malicious. I always cry when I look at these two sentences because I spent about six years building a business about you know, correlating alerts and, and now it's distilled down into two, two sentences, right? But I hope you agree that it's a very, it's a nice way to start. It's very explainable. A lot of customers hate the black box approach of what the what, why did you alert me on this? And and you go, oh, I'm not sure. Uh, the ML engine told me to 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 alert you on it. We're really trying to become explain like trying to really push this narrative of being you know adding explainability to this. So hopefully you agree. Pretty explainable, right? Twenty alerts correlated together. Exploitation. There's a malicious IP address. It's unactioned. Now after conducting this is my analyst now after conducting some OSINT. The IP address with the technical details attached was seen conducting ping sweeps on that port. Sophos Labs has also verified the malicious nature of this IP. It's already been associated with malware. Now, we don't bang this drum enough, but when you guys are partnering with us, you don't just partner with my analysts. You partner with tier one, tier two, tier three analysts. You partner with threat hunters. You partner with security analytics engineers, and you partner with Sophos Labs, which is our threat intelligence, like absolute beast gurus with all things threat intel. And our MDR ops team and our Sophos Labs team and our data scientists work together. We call it the X ops group, right? And you have a sexy name for this. But that's about 500 people together in that group alone. So you plug one of your customers into MDR, you're not plugging into a tier one analyst, you're plugging into an absolute machine of 500 people doing this day to day. And so this is our analyst working on this case, sending it to labs and saying, hey, give me some more intel on this. And then our labs will go to work. Now, after further investigation use, using the XDR, so this is us pivoting into the into the customer's data lake, no internal network processes were observed within the data lake in relation to this IP, so that's good news. At this time, however, we recommend performing the below reference remediation steps. Let us know if you have any questions or concerns. Update the block list to include the IP listed above in your network perimeter. Please inform the MDR team of actions taken. This obviously is the MSP game, goes to you guys, and guess where your value add and your services are? You go and update that block list for the customer. 
So that was what I had to tell. Hopefully I brought that alive. It's, it's taking lots of data, it's cleaning it, it's correlating, it's grouping into stories, it's escalating it, and it's sending a really sexy write-up to then you guys confront the, the value-added service on top of that. David, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna say that um, that was awesome. Um, I hope everybody out here agrees. I wanna bring, uh, I wanna bring Chris Wayman in to ask some questions, but me being on this webinar, listening to you present that is not gonna be a good thing for you because you're gonna get <laughs> really busy really quickly. And Chris knows, Chris knows. Um, Chris, you wanna, you wanna take some of the questions? I see a, a whole bunch of questions coming in. Um, you wanna take those questions as somebody that can actually speak the language? Yeah, so Dave, let's just start with like, let's recap, so what? Um, mm. there's, a lot, yep. there's a lot of MDR vendors, right? There's a lot of noise, and there's a whole other conversation to be had about how I think uh, the industry is doing itself a disservice and all of us a disservice by everybody saying the same thing when not well, everything's the same. Yep. So what's the, like if you were gonna summarize the takeaway of so what, why Sophos versus everybody else, why what we're doing, what's your what's your summary? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, first and foremost, why why get this extra data in is purely about more telemetry means more visibility and we can thought attacks quicker and sooner in the attack chain. And the example I always love to give is think of that, th think of the, the, and it's a pretty, it's a, it's a somber example, isn't it? But the terrorist in the airport, right? You don't want to catch the bomb on the plane. You want to have signals early on the, as soon as that person walks into the, the, the sliding doors open, you want people on it. That's all about getting the telemetry earlier on before they execute their end mission, which is to detonate that endpoint, right? So how, that's how I like to think about these packs. You give us firewall data, you deploy our NDR, you deploy our IAM, we have amazing vantage points of that data and that kill chain um, that you saw here in the example, your perimeter's lighting up, we go and confirm nothing's internal. I mean, if it did get internal, we'll then pivot and, and do some actions on the endpoint, but we give you that assurance that, that we've, we've seen something Right, and we've confirmed that nothing has happened. That's super valuable. So it's about getting data, and and the the why Sophos is and and you compare us to other MSSPs and other MDRs. Always push them on this point of look, what the hell are you doing with the data? And that's why I said I, I sort of love and hate this industry at the same time because everyone sounds the same. I'll take your logs. I'll correlate them. It's like yeah, but hang on, what, what are you actually doing with it? Because if you're just chucking it into a bucket and you're enriching investigations with it, chances are you're not doing anything with it. So why Sophos is well. We have a lot of clever people thinking about this challenge, about operationalizing the data and fundamentally what it provides us, our partners on the on, in, on the call and your customers is greater visibility and, and, and therefore a more effective security service. Yeah, there's a related one that uh, Stephen just asked that is compare MDR to SIM. And I know this is, this was really uh, the value prop of uh, your company, right? Of SOC OS, yeah. this is where you started. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we've been, we work with SIM a lot. We actually started, it, it we're all sort of defense backgrounds of BAE systems. We worked in their SOC. We understood the pain of SIM. SIM is a big old powerful piece of technology, but if you don't have a team to run it and the sophistication, and the skills, it sits there and collects dust, right? And so the, the, the pitch for us was go beyond the SIM. Um, we actually thought that, and, and uh, I guarantee this will uh, resonate with the audience is, where the, the where we're trending and how we used to pitch this was in today's world of security, it's almost like the SIM is being decentralized. You're getting all these point solutions, like your customers have deployed them, right? Duo, you've got Microsoft, you've got the endpoint from Sophos. What are these things doing? They're looking at data, they have threat detection use cases and they're generating alerts. They're SIMs. Your customers have deployed six SIMs. And so the SIMs, are, uh, you're not worrying about how Duo does its analytics. You leave Duo to do its SIM thing. You leave us to do our endpoint SIM. And then what the challenge therefore becomes is how do I triage this? And so SIM has its place, I think from a maybe a compliance play and store the logs, but you can do that very cheaply. To do, to become, to use a SIM to do compliance and log storage is a very silly and expensive way to do that. From a, so separate the SIM use case from compliance and log storage and threat detection. I guarantee what we're doing blows SIM out of the water from a threat detection standpoint, but we don't play in that log sort of storage and compliance space. That's how I like to think about it. Think about SIM as those two capabilities. And if you approach those two capabilities fundamentally differently, the way in just in your mindset, you can also fundamentally change how you sort of operationally deal with that as well. Yeah, it kind of goes back to first principles, right? Like what's the, what are you trying to get to and what's the best way to do it? SIM was really the best thing we had for a long time. But decoupling that, or like you said, everybody picks a stack. All of the solutions you've got in your network, you've picked to do the job that you bought it for. And so when 
you send that to some sort of operational entity, MDR in this case, you expect it to be done quickly and well. And you and I are both data nerds, you know, kind of the mm. spoke about this is when those products have updates or changes to telemetry and the data structure or the taxonomy mm. or the alert gets updated, if your SIM doesn't know how to deal with that, it can blow the whole thing up or, you know, worst case, it just, it, it I guess, it just misses it. it. Yeah. And you miss a potentially meaningful piece of data that you paid good money for. And so mm -hmm. the way to do all that data, that ingest clean kind of pipeline stuff you were talking about um, is is really different. So if you're a data nerd like us and you want to learn more about it, let us know. We we have a lot of a lot of content to go deeper on that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll jump in, Chris, because that, that point, right, the error handling to, to pick up third party changes is super crucial. And we've been burnt. We've seen SIM or MSSPs back with SIM. A customer calls and say, mate, I've been, I've had a breach here, and then the 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 MSP looks looks into their logs and says, shit, I didn't, I I didn't know they changed their data structure and their format, so all my rules are out the window now because it's looking up very specific things. So in our clean function, I didn't talk talk about it, but in that clean function I talked about, right at the start of that is a bunch of like filtering logic that says, have we seen this format before? And if we get a no it gets put on a completely different queue for my engineers to jump in it straight away. So we have error and robustness in that clean function because we can't trust the third party vendor to go be the good, you know, could you imagine, you know, Microsoft giving us a call, heads up guys, we're changing our data structure. It's not going to happen. So we have to put that in place and we do that really, really well. So error handling and having a robust pipeline early on is absolutely crucial and at the core of what we do. Yeah, I think that's great. So there's a couple of questions actually specifically on integrations. Uh, Edward's wanting to know about WatchGuard firewalls. Are we planning to integrate with that? Mate, are you reading my email? So WatchGuard's gone live, I think today or tomorrow. So WatchGuard firewalls, you've got customers, um, send them our way. Absolutely, activate it for them. Really good feed. Perfect. And then how about integration packs for uh, only being available for MDR as opposed to XDR? Is that That's a question, sorry? Yeah, so are integration packs only for MDR and not in X, the XDR product? Currently, yes. So the answer is absolutely yes, only for MDR. But the beauty of us having an MDR service is basically the perfect test bed before we release it to the wild in XDR world. So, you know, think about what how I think about it is we're testing all of this with MDR. We're refining our analytics. Quarter four, and I'll have to hold Stephen. Stephen's my counterpart. So he's the, the director for XDR. Stephen tells me by quarter four, you will have the third party integration packs available for XDR. Yeah, I think even just philosophically, it's a little bit different the way we do this. A lot of, you'll see some of the big name competitors that we've got, they've got third-party integration for their XDR component, but not their MDR component. Um, mm -hmm. We kind of conceive of our MDR as the biggest customer of XDR. And so the XDR detection logic is often written by the MDR team. So by doing it this way and having that delay, and, and Chris, it's a really good question, you benefit from all of the detection logic that the MDR team has, you know, written and, and done. Um, mm -hmm. You have all the other problems of now being the one responsible to deal with it and, and everything else that, you know, makes MDR the value prop. But yeah, coming, I guess is the, the long and short. Yeah, piece. and it's, so you just triggered something there, right? Um, sort of that about the value of, of getting, you know, value from something else. One thing I didn't touch on, which is really cool is We've got so many examples. And remember how I was talking about Sophos Labs and us working together? I've got so many examples where I can tell you that your customer has proof point. They enable it for us. We did a case. We see a domain. We go, this looks like phishing. Send it to our Sophos Labs team who hasn't seen it before in their intelligence. They do some further analysis. And it took about 50 minutes. So Sophos Labs looked at this domain, worked with our analyst team and said, yeah, this, this does look like a pretty, this is like a spun up recently. It's doing nefarious things. And then what Sophos Labs does is take that intelligence and then updates our entire signature base. So our firewalls, our endpoints will get updated with new threat intelligence based on a third party bit of data coming into MDR. And the, the so what there is, is really powerful for you guys, because if you enable third party integrations right, with your customers, you, they go, why, why proof point? Well, what are the, not only it's a great vector, right, for, for attacks and phishing, it should be definitely a, a fundamental thing that we should be looking at, but it's the entire customer base of MDR by you enabling a proof point connection, we actually harden our own Sophos estate. And there's not many vendors that can say that. And that's, yeah, that's a, I think, a bit of a bragging rights. Yeah, that kind of closed loop improvement system is really interesting. Again, we have a lot of 
documentation and kind of talk tracks around that stuff if you have customers that are interested or you're interested. Um, but it, it is quite interesting that the way we do MDR differently than our, some of our competitors. Mm -hmm. um, Robin, you're asking about cost associated with integrations. There is, it's, a, it's on the price list. You can go put it in, it's per user uh, tiering. So you become the benefit, you know, you benefit from all of the other user tier products that you've got in there. If you have questions on that, um, your MSP rep can help you or we can, we can talk through it specifically. Adjacent to that though, Dave, if you were gonna pick um, integrations that are important or priority or, you know, you're looking at all this stuff, it would be great for everybody to have everything. I think everybody agrees we all want all the things, but the reality of MSP is it's margin based and you know, oftentimes mm. customers question even small increases on things. So yep. it's trade offs. How do yep. you how do you justify or how do you conceptualize building mm. solution for a customer? Do you prioritize firewall or integration or email or cloud? Yep. What integration packs do you go with? So let's just look at the data. We have sold the most of firewall, then NDR, then email, then identity. Now, that's just the data view. So that's across our 16,000 customers, right? So that's that's the sort of stack rank. But it it, it depends on what industry. So I would say, so healthcare, uh, um, manufacturing, anything with like uh, where you can't deploy your agent, right? So you can't get protection on, on an old scanner, for instance, or an MRI machine, whatever it is. So healthcare, IoT devices, NDR is going to be a play. You get the east-west visibility. A lot of a lot of people are stressed about that, right? So the east-west traffic. Uh, and um, sort of the, what's happening on the network, right? In, inside my barrier, NDRs you play, right? But if it's sort of not an IoT centric, I would definitely be, I mean, it's not a hard sell to go back to your customers and say, you've got an IPS on your firewall, email and identity. I would, I, and it's really hard for me to stack those three. I mean, I would probably stack email because it's like a, a huge vector, email or identity, but I'm torn. Um, but, but like what's gonna be the easiest for you to sell is gonna be those three. And depending on the industry, NDR as well. Yeah, and everybody's got uh, thoughts on um, analysts, but the analyst view is they think identity and email are probably top ones. But I think it really comes down to building that uh, kind of holistic solution, which I think dovetails into into us as a portfolio company, right? We're talking about third party integrations. We still integrate with all the Sophos products, but those are included at no cost. So Ryan, you were asking about Indeed. cost integrations, third party does have a cost, but if you've got a Sophos Firewall or Sophos Mobile or Sophos Email or Cloud Optics, a lot of that stuff is actually uh, included in the, in the underlying MDR cost. So the, the conversation point of um, when you're picking your stack or you're looking at some of the reasons that you might switch vendors, there's, there's a lot of things there to consider um, that I think just we're all aware of as, as working in MSP, uh, you're trying to figure out what stack you wanna position for your customers. Mm -hmm. um, my last question, Dave, is going to be around incident response. Roddy talked about this at the beginning. Uh, you know, we have a full incident response team. That's the rapid response team. If you're not familiar, that's what he was talking about at the beginning. What, where does incident response play inside of MDR and maybe kind of in the segment of the industry? How is incident mm. response dealt with in MDR? Yeah, this is... Yeah, I love this topic. It really highlights the data asymmetry, right? So us as vendors, which MSPs, vendors just like us, right? And in your, you will absolutely resonate with that. That every customer, when they say incident response, means something different, right? So I always impl implore our sales team to, to to ask when they say, "I need incident response," just say, "What what do you mean by incident response?" and and always unpick that because oftentimes you, we as the vendors and a little bit more on the uh, higher up on the sophistication scale, right? We think it's the full blown digital forensics, full scale incident response, a statewide, you know, all the good stuff with log triaging, malware analysis, right? And and that is absolutely the case for our MDR complete. But a lot of our customers, they will say, oh, as long as you can isolate the host and delete a file, right, and block a user, which is which is included in our, our Sophos MDR essentials package as well, right? So I, I always ask the customer what they mean and what they need and what they want and educate them through that journey. Well, um, we have one minute left and I'm going to use it. So Stephen's asking about uh, kind of remediation and it's dovetails out of that incident response component. How do you talk to somebody, maybe that's a customer that's concerned about granting a third party rights to remediate? Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great question. And so 
our own Sophos estate, right? We, we obviously take action and uh, you, the, the, the guys spoke about sort of the response mode, right? Authorize or collaborate. We can absolutely on our own estate, you know, isolate everything, do the response actions on, 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 our, on our devices. For third party, it's um, it, it, we, you saw on that case write up was we would recommend it as sort of a guidance, as a remediation guidance. And so that's really where we are as a business with, with third party. So FortiGate Firewalls, Cisco Duo, you won't see us uh, just yet say, hey, we've updated the block list for you. There's a few reasons for that. One, it's the customer appetite for it. I think everyone would agree. It's harder to convince a customer to give the keys to the kingdom with full super god admin rights across your all your estate, which is fair enough. Uh, but two, the partner opportunity is massive. So the remediation guidance on third party um, on third party uh, providers is a really good place for, for, for partners like yourselves to, to play in, right? We'll go and say, update the block list or go and do this for this user. You guys can then front that and, and, and take on that response action yourself. So a sort of remediation, absolutely it happens on Sophos estate products because it's our baby, it's our products and we're very comfortable with it. When it's third party, we, 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 go, we lead with remediation guidance we, however, have a sore capability and you'll see more and more sort of uh, we, we will be able to take specific actions if the customer and the partner want us to do so. Right. So we, I think we're launching with Okta later this year where we'll be able to suspend you know, user creds and, and enforce MFA and reset passwords and things if the customer wants to. Right. And if it's comfortable for the, with the partner and the customer. But that's very much how, how I sort of see, see the land, Chris, separate it with first party versus third party. Yeah, and I think that that question of autonomy is something you all deal with anyway. Your customer has to has to build that trust. I think it comes down to the trust between us and you, ultimately. Um, and you said people get gun shy kind of about third party stuff. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks it's a great idea. But when you really get down to brass tacks of what that looks like, my experience has been um, they want a little bit less than what they actually are. We're, we're kind of building into that with the industry. We're getting people comfortable with the idea of getting yeah. more remediation across the stack. So yeah. I think, um, yeah, it's all really interesting stuff. We still got 49 people here. So there's a couple okay. more questions. We'll run a, we'll run a couple well, I think, over. Let me, hang out. let me add just one thing because it's a uh, Rody. I think it was. I keep forgetting his name. Rudy Rody was on talking about Cisco Duo and the response action, like the the um, collaboration mode, right? So a lot of this comes down with when you're first starting, right? You're first working with the MDR. You probably you're probably a little bit more. Let's just see what this is about. Maybe let's do collaborate. And that's exactly what what Rody did, right? He was on Cisco Duo. He was he was he was using us as collaborate, and he's like, right, I've hit an incident. You guys know what you're doing. There's some clever people here that have my back. You gain that experience and you gain that confidence. And with that, actually, you start to trust that partner more and more. And then with that trust comes, actually, I don't mind you having a little bit more admin rights to do X, Y, and Z, right? Yeah. Um, one of the last questions I have in here from uh, Ron, and I think it's really relevant, is how do you deal with SMBs on a limited IT or security budget? They want security, but they're budget conscious. And you and I, have a lot of conversations mm. about this being a journey, right? It's a continuum and you're kind of, you don't have to jump all the way to get benefits. So what advice would you give Ron and other people that are talking about budgets and kind of the reality of cost? Yeah, it's really hard. It always comes down to the price value equation, right? So you heard it from, from Rudy as well about pitching the value. I know pitching the FUD, I know we hate that in, in cyber, but a lot of it is the educational piece of if this goes wrong, right? A lot of people, if it hasn't happened to me, and you know, we all roll our eyes in the security industry, but a lot of people are still like that. It hasn't happened to me. And I think the macro trend is in our favor. So, so time is time is for us, ladies and gentlemen, which is great. But I think it's behooving on us, right, to, to be that educational piece and 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 to, to teach and to educate that user to say, you might think this is expensive, but wait until the ransomware happens, right? That that you you really know what expensive is then. Maybe and it's sad. You heard the implications, and not many people bang on about this, but the don't worry about the financial. The human implications are real. If a school, you know, we, we see education being one of our biggest victim areas, right? It is seriously like heart stringing stuff. The headmistress or the headmaster gets fired, right? Schools shut down. Kids can't learn. This is some serious implications, right, on people's lives. And, you know, that, that is, a, is a, an effective way to sell, right? I know it's price value. I know there's always budget constraints, but I would say educate, educate, and educate, but also pick your poison with where is the crown jewels and try to offer. You guys are doctors. Just prescribe well, right? Understand what the pains are. 
what they have available in the purse strings. And it's your job to, to look into the prescription cabinet to go, right, well, this solution is probably the best to maximize the security effectiveness based on the constraints we have, which is which is effectively budget, right? And risk, risk, risk profile, of course. Yep. The bottom line is do what you've done with proper discovery and and it's a journey. There's steps it along is. the way. You don't have to jump all the way to the end in that budget consciousness. So Scott, I think we're at about time. Is there anything you want to add or to close us out here? Yeah, no, I mean, I wanted to just, I wanted to talk briefly about the the question about cost. Um, we do an analysis and we actually have a another webinar that's up on Partner Portal under the MSP hub section that will actually talk about how to sell cybersecurity as a service and ways and, and methods that you can actually bundle the SOFO stack. And obviously you can replace the firewall with another vendor and, and so forth. But if you look at like a 25 user organization and you do a XGS 136 firewall, maybe a couple of wireless access points, a 48 port switch, you do MDR complete and server MDR complete, you throw in email device encryption and fish threat, you take that pricing, and if you're at the, say, the 1,000 to 5,000 user license band, you take that pricing and you normalize it on a per user per month basis, meaning the cost of the firewall could be the hardware, divide that by 36 months, divide it by 25 users. You break down that stack, and that cost to you as an MSP is roughly $17 per user per month. You take that and you sell it for $50 per user per month, which is insane in this market. You know, we have MSPs. Um, I was talking to Roddy yesterday when we were preparing for the webinar. You know, we had somebody in the hedge fund that sells us for $900 per user per month on the, just for security, right? Um, but if you sell it for 50, you're making $30,000 over the course of three years. You take that and you deploy that to 100 customers at $30,000 for three years is $3 million divided by, you know, 12 or divided by three years that's a million dollars a year in profit to you and clearly that fifty dollars sh should not be fifty dollars every single pair group and community out there you're selling that for 250 300 again it does depend on your location if you're in new york city you might be selling it for 500 if you're in iowa you might be selling it for 100 150 something like that but breaking it down for the entire stack of Sophos products for 25 users at the 1,000 to 5,000 pricing band, $17 per user per month, you sell it for something more than that, and you are gonna be making significant profit. Um, you know, Obviously on the management and providing tier one support to the customer, where we provide tier two support to you, but still you break it down to that you know, very base fundamental um, cost model and you know it doesn't really cost that much more right I think when you get into MDR and, and server MDR um, on the complete side that is where the price is going to that's the majority of the, the cost contribution but again this includes incident response it also includes breach warranty protection so like David was saying if you know you're in a scenario and you get breached or you have to respond to a ransomware attack you have to hire some external incident response company. You might know the cost per hour, but you're not gonna know how many hours it's gonna to take to do that remediation. And that by itself is going to pay for that $17 per user per month over the course of three years. So we, we have a, a webinar that we focus on. It's up on Partner Portal. I would highly encourage you to take a look at that. Um, if you have more questions, just send me an email. Um, we also have a Facebook group. I'm more than happy to, you know, invite you to that Facebook group at Sophos MSP uh, Connect. And with that said, I, I apologize for going over, but I wanted to absolutely capitalize on having David on this webinar as well as Chris Wayman. Um, literally, Chris was my favorite. Chris, I, you get some competition now with David, so um, I really appreciate both of your time. Roddy, thank you so much if you're still on, and Eric as well. Um, if anybody has any questions, feedback, you know, requests, whatever, reach out to your MSP sales team, reach out to me directly, you know, scott.barlow at sophos.com. And I uh, hope everybody has a great rest of the week and look forward to seeing everybody face to face at an upcoming event. We will be at a lot of events, um, you know, starting uh, next or starting this week. Um, or no, I'm sorry, starting next week in um, IT Nation Secure. So thanks everybody for your time. And uh, David, Chris, Roddy, Eric, really appreciate it. Thanks everybody. Welcome. Good to be here. Thank you. Bye-bye.